Roman authors uh, that had been largely lost for a thousand years. It was in Florence that those schools were all rediscovered, those works translated, studied vigorously, and many of the old Greek schools of philosophy and Roman schools of philosophy reborn in the uh, Florentine Greek Republic as well. Religion is important as well because, of course, Europe had been very uh, religiously focused for a thousand years. Florence was noted for its worldliness. Of course, there's all of the, 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 uh, the generations of bad popes who were more interested in sex and money and power than pursuing religious spiritualism. But the point here is that philosophically and religiously, you have a much more worldly culture a much more naturalistic right, emphasis in people's thinking, and there are religious reactions right against that, but the tenor is to be moving in a much more naturalistic, worldly direction. The groundworks for modern science are being laid in Florence as well, and so this is the culture that the artists are all born into. So I make the claim, the reason why Florence became a great art culture is not just because it was rich, right? Art does typically require a lot of money right, to be able to support all those artists and all the people who are going to buy right, art and so forth. But it also had the freedom right, that comes with a Republican kind of politics. And it had an intense interest in the natural world. And you see that reflected in the art as well. All right, let's try to put that in the category, again, in the economics. We have proto-free market economies, right, in Florence, with an enormous amount of cosmopolitan immigrants, right, from all over the world, of course, want to go where the opportunities are economically. They are flocking to Florence. Florentines are themselves traveling all over the world, coming back to Florence as cosmopolitan individuals. Republican politics. At the same time, just as with the Greeks, there's of course ongoing tension, right, with various authoritarian regimes. The Florentines are constantly squabbling, right, with the Milanese, the Neapolitans, the Romans, the French, the other great powers. Sometimes they are conquered, uh, sometimes they have to fight back from having been conquered. And then in the religion and philosophy, we have a very naturalistic and worldly focus and a great deal of diversity religiously uh, because of the large number of immigrants and people experimenting with and expressing interest in the old Roman religions, the old Greek religions, and other pagan schools of thought. All right, another example. Right, let's go to Holland. Uh, Holland is largely the, uh, the provinces in the extreme west of uh, the Dutch states. Uh, and it was there that another awesomely original and powerful art culture right, was developed. The uh, famous names here, I'll just mention three, Vermeer with his uh, great studies of light, right, naturalistic light, uh, Rembrandt, again, an amazing colorist, but in terms of theme, his intense ability, an original ability to capture human character and the inner life right, of what the human being is experiencing and has experienced. And this is Simon Glieger, the Dutch right, loved the sea. And of course, they were another trading culture. One way in which they were innovative was they were the first, as far as we can tell, to do seascapes. Right? There have been landscapes, but seascapes and skyscapes was an uh, innovative focus and a very popular genre in the Dutch tradition. So, Vermeer, Rembrandt, and uh, Dutch seascapes are, uh, of course, landmarks in, uh, in our history. And there are any number of other artists whom we could mention, but the question we'll ask again is why did, again, a revolution occur in Holland? We can look at other significant cities nearby, Copenhagen, not much going on. Hamburg, not much going on, right, artistically. Uh, all Northwestern right, European cultures, we're going to keep our data samples uh, in line with each other. Well, what's different, right? Uh, actually, let me give you some more names here. Sam Redam, Rager, Rembrandt, Fabridius, Peter Hooch, Vermeer, right? and there are others who can easily add to this list. But again, I would just like you to attend to the dates. The youngest of them is uh, Sam Redam, born in 1597. 
the year 1601, and the rest are all born in the first part of the 1600s. And uh, if you look at the outstanding Dutch Golden Age artists, they are all of the 1600s. So we asked the same question, well, what's going on in the Dutch city-states, particularly in the West, right, where all of the artistic activity is going to happen in the century previous to the explosion of awesome art being created? And what we find is that politically, the Dutch achieved independence. It was independence from Spain in 1579. Spain was then, along with France, one of the great European powers, and they largely dominated the European politics, and the Dutch were under their control. But the Dutch, over the course of a long stretch of time, fought back against the Spanish, tried to achieve their independence, and then largely succeeded in doing so by 1579. Having done so, they proceeded to throw off the foreign right, powers that were controlling them, threw off their own internal feudal history and transformed themselves politically into a republic. Again, with broad participation among the citizenry, divisions of power, uh, and regular elections, so the power is transformed uh, consistently over the course of uh, years. So economically, or sorry, politically then, the Dutch achieved a hard-fought independence and think of themselves as independent fighting individuals and they put in place a more modern uh, Democrat or Republican type of institution. And what's going on economically? Well, again, the Dutch become a famous trading nation. And these are small numbers of people, relatively insignificant, we could say, in the 1400s cultures way out in the northeast of Europe, very poor, but they start trading. They start uh, uh, trading further afield all across Europe. They build up their navy. Of course, they make it all the way out to Asia. They develop a huge trading network. They develop the first uh, uh, corporate form. They, uh, uh, the Dutch East India Company is uh, one of the first models, a very flexible modern business form. They are, again, very innovative with their financial instruments, right, developing stocks and bonds. The first modern stock market uh, is in Amsterdam to trade all of the stocks in the companies that are being created. Sophisticated insurance in instruments uh, for their worldwide trading network. And then uh, sophisticated banking is also developed. So the point here, then, is that by the end of the 1500s and in the first decade of the 1600s, we have a series of small cities, Amsterdam most prominent right among them, that become independent, they become republican, they start to trade, they become very cosmopolitan, and as a result of that, they become spectacularly rich. Right? It's a very prosperous culture. And again, this then is the culture into which all of the great artists of the Dutch Golden Age are born. They're born into a free, prosperous, cosmopolitan culture and art is uh, the result. I should mention again something about the religion and the philosophy. The uh, Dutch had their religious wars, Catholics against Protestants, Protestants against Protestants, everybody against the Jews, right, and the minority of Muslims and so forth. And they uh, were very nasty about it, as uh, most Europeans were about it for many times, but they were the among the first to say, this is not sustainable. Let's live and let live. You do your religion. I will do my religion. I won't like what you're doing, but I will tolerate it. And they developed a culture of religious toleration. And as a result of that, they became very friendly to anybody with any religion as long as it was peaceful. And so it became the place where if people got in trouble religiously in their home country, they would go to Holland. But then they would bring their talents, they would bring their wealth, and contribute to the development of the Dutch right, economy. It also became the place in the 1600s where famous philosophers and scientists, when they got in trouble in their home countries, right, in Italy, in Spain, France, and England, they would leave, they would go into exile, they would go to Holland. 
So Holland is attracting then the best scientists, the best philosophers. It's extraordinarily rich. It's extraordinarily free. This is the culture in which the artists develop. So if we try to categorize it again, under our headings, economics, we have a largely free market economy. It's very cosmopolitan with lots of visitors and immigrants. And of course, the Dutch themselves are traveling the world. They uh, uh, should say republic rather than democracy here. They are still uh, struggling against the Spanish, the French, and the other, in many respects, larger uh, European powers. There's tension with England, which is a rising right, power as well. So they're under the threat of authoritarian takeovers, but they uh, are vigorous and succeed in holding their own. And again, we have a philosophy that is very diversified, very naturalistic. Some of the best science and philosophy uh, in the world is being done in Holland in the 1600s as well. All right, one more historical example. Uh, I want to jump ahead a few centuries to Paris. Uh, Paris in the second half of the 1800s right now. And this is uh, the era that gave us Impressionism and set the, uh, the stage for many of the schools within uh, uh, early modern art that were going to come to dominate by the time we get to the 1890s and the earliest decades of the 20th century. Uh, Kayabat, a uh, favorite piece of mine. Uh, I teach in Chicago and nearby, so I get to visit the Art Institute and see this one, and it's quite large and wonderful. Uh, Monet, very famous water lilies, widely beloved. Fissaro, landscape. Eduardo, or sorry, Edward uh, Manet. Uh, painting a sometime lover, Bertha Morissette, who was an excellent painter in her own right. Degas, loving young girls learning ballet. An interesting perspective being presented here. Basile, painting his studio with the artist himself and his friends, hanging out, talking about art, living the artistic life. That becomes a subject of art. An American Impressionist studying in Paris, which mother lovingly giving her daughter a bath. And then the high life, Renoir, people at the theater dressed up right for a night out. All right, so these are representative paintings from the latter part of the, uh, the 1800s. And again, we ask the same question, why does Paris at this time become an center of artistic innovation and high quality, why not uh, nearby, say, Prussia? Again, just a matter of a few hundred kilometers, a relatively vigorous culture uh, in Prussia. You know, we know lots of going, stuff is going to happen uh, coming out of Prussia uh, in this time and over the course of the next 50 years, but not uh, at, in the 18, late 1800s, uh, much significantly right, artistic. And here to uh, make, again, a long story short, what we find is by the time we get to the second part of the 1800s, Paris right, and France, largely in the north, has developed a much more free market-oriented culture. It has largely decisively thrown off its feudal past. It is becoming much more right, cosmopolitan. Right? The French are trading right, all over the world and developing the business infrastructure to be able to do so. French political history, of course, over the course of this last century is much more disastrous. The French Revolution right, largely went horribly wrong. They had a civil war, they had Napoleon, uh, and wars were extraordinarily right, devastating. They were back and forth in the early part of the 1800s between the restoration of the monarchy and then more republican forms. But by the time we get to the 1860s, the 1870s, France is decisively becoming a republic right, in its political uh, structure with, again, widespread divisions of power, regular elections, and they still do politically have tension. They're aware of foreign threats and they're trying to be vigilant against them. 
Religiously, by the time we get to the end of the 1800s, France is very worldly. Catholicism uh, is the dominant religion in France. People would consider themselves Catholic, but they're not fired up about it. It's more of a cultural thing than it is a strictly religious thing. And in France, because of the politics and because of the economics, you find a significant more amount of diversity, particularly in the biggest cities and particularly in Paris. Now what we've done then over the course of the last uh, half hour or so is sample right, four of the greatest, uh, I think you could make the argument, greatest art cultures right, ever, certainly in the Western traditions, the ones that the art historians get the most excited about, and certainly the ones if we are art lovers, when we travel, we want to go to Greece, we want to go to Holland, we want to go to Paris, we want to go to Florence, largely to see the legacies of art that were created in, in those cities. And the striking thing is that Athens right, became a great art culture, but nearby Sparta, also a major power, left nothing. Okay? The reason is that Sparta was not cosmopolitan, and it was not a trading culture, it was an inward-looking culture, and it was agricultural based. It was not democratic, it was authoritarian. It wasn't uh, based on the notion of political freedom, economic freedom, religious freedom. Instead, it was hierarchical and very strict. One develops great art, the other does nothing. We can compare Florence right, with its near neighbor, Naples. Naples has some artistic treasures, all of them imported. No homegrown Neapolitan art culture at the time. Uh, it's focusing its energy on maintaining its feudal power, on military conquest, and so forth. Meanwhile, Florence develops a great artistic culture because it is commercial and a republic. Holland is commercial, it's cosmopolitan, it's a republic. By contrast, at this time, Denmark remains a kingdom. It's more inward-looking, it is much more hierarchical. Paris, compared to Prussia, Prussia is authoritarian. Paris is cosmopolitan and commercial. All right, so this is uh, broad strokes history for great art cultures and for non-art cultures, why that happened. Let me just give you one more quick example. If you uh, consider the United States in the 20th century, again, a very vigorous art culture in, uh, in many dimensions here. We all watch Hollywood movies. They're a worldwide, uh, uh, worldwide phenomenon based in uh, LA uh, and a subsection like Hollywood right, as well. Uh, there is New York City right, with its theater culture. There are a half a dozen major music centers for all different kinds of music in Chicago, Memphis, Nashville, and other places as well. So again, we have a very vigorous art culture New York also has a, uh, a high painting culture and a high sculpture culture that has developed in the 20th century right, as well. And I think we can make right, a similar point, right, of all of the nations in the world in the 20th century, the United States was largely right, free market, or at least relatively speaking, uh, largely democratic, right, and Republican, largely friendly to immigrants, right, coming in, bringing their talents and their energies, right, from all over the world. In religion, very tolerant, uh, separating politics right from religion. People are free to practice their religion as they want. So what you have is a largely free, a largely tolerant, largely cosmopolitan, very wealthy right, country, and it is able then to support a large amount of innovative and very vigorous right, artistic stuff that is going on. All right, to put my point right more formally, I want to say that to develop the great art culture, three things right, seem to need to come together. Right? The most important thing, of course, is the artist. Right? You have to have people who are creative right? and who have a certain amount of courage to try to be experimental, to do what they think is important to them. Uh, that seems to require a certain amount of education and, uh, in many cases, a kind of uh, cushion and support from a family network. Uh, that will enable them to pursue right, their, their artistic right, career. The artists, though, need to be supported by entrepreneurs right, in a few respects. 
Uh, artists, of course, uh, if you're going to become a world-class artist, you have to have a good education. Almost all of the great artists typically are traveled persons. They have music lessons, art lessons, and so forth when they are young, and that takes money, and that has to be created by entrepreneurial activities. And of course, they have to be able to sell their art. So you have to have a culture in which there are many people with money who are then able to purchase the art. So the entrepreneurial culture that creates the wealth has to be in place or you go, excuse me, you do not get an artistic culture. And the politicians also seem to be essential to it as well in creating a structure right, within which both the entrepreneurs and the artists are free to be creative in the way entrepreneurs are creative and artists are creative. Political authoritarianism that cracks down, stops the entrepreneurial activity, it stops the artistic activity, and that goes nowhere as well. So you have the right kind of politicians, the right kind of entrepreneurs, and the artists. Those three have to come together, and as far as we can tell, every time significant things have happened artistically, those three have come together in one place. But I want to mention some decisive individuals in art history who stand out, uh, particularly in the entrepreneurial politician -like category as well. In the Greek context, there are a huge number of people who are important, but in the middle part of the 400s, Pericles, the leading politician of the time, was decisive. It was largely through his initiative, his decisiveness, and his marshalling resources that much of the uh, Parthenon right, was built, much of the Acropolis was developed, many of the theatrical performances, sculptural commissions, uh, and others were, were developed. Right? Without Pericles, Athens would have been great, but perhaps it would not have been as great as it ended up being. So he is uh, right, a political figure who stands out in the Athenian history. The same thing is true when we jump to Florence. Right? The Medici family, Cosimo, to some extent, as a patron of the arts, but more spectacularly, Lorenzo, right, de Medici, head of the great banking family, but also significantly involved in the politics, decisive in sponsoring the humanists, sponsoring a large number of young artists, including Michelangelo, right, and others when they were young and formative, and without the Medici, right, support. Florence would have been great, but not as great as it had been. Single individuals can make a decisive difference. If we jump to Holland, Constantine Huygens is a significant individual here, an art collector, but also in his official capacity as secretary to the Prince of Orange. Once the Dutch developed independence, they wanted to have a homegrown Dutch art culture. His job was to go out and be a talent scout he is the one who discovered Rembrandt, and Rembrandt was young, and several artists who were to become significant in the Dutch scene gave him early commissions, gave him early support, and enabled a very talented, right, young man to uh, launch his career in a very decisive fashion. Without Huygens, as far as we can tell, Rembrandt may very well have just languished in obscurity. So another decisive thing. In France, and the Impressionists, without Paul Durand Ruel, we would not have Impressionism. He was one of the early believers in the Impressionists, going back to the 1850s and the 1860s, staked his small personal fortune several times, lost it, went bankrupt several times, continued to support Monet, Pissarro, and the others when they were desperately poor and unable to sell their works. Uh, finally, uh, through many creative uh, endeavors, uh, put the, the, the Impressionists right on the map. And we could also mention uh, Hausmann. It is Hausmann, right, who is the architect and city planner, right, who received a, a commission to tear down much of the decrepit old neighborhoods of Paris that were uh, <laughs> filled with sewage right, and rats and causing low life expectancy and it is his artistic vision architecturally in terms of urban planning that built the modern, beautiful, cosmopolitan Paris that we all know and love uh, when we travel there. 
In the, the American context, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Guggenheims, uh, Solomon Guggenheim and his niece Peggy uh, Guggenheim, uh, uh, art lover in the early 20th century, who again sponsored the, uh, the early work of many artists in New York who were going to become significant. Peggy Guggenheim in the middle part of the 20th century, carrying on that family tradition. And the Guggenheims then, again, working with the city of New York, and bought the land and gowed by the Guggenheim Museum, the gorgeous uh, facility right on the, uh, on the Upper West Side right of Manhattan. That is, again, right, a world art center. So the point is, many artists, right, many political figures, many art uh, entrepreneurs, but there also do seem to be decisive individuals who step up uh, at various points and take good and transform it to the next level up to the, to the, uh, to the grade. Now, by uh, concluding section, we uh, come to where we are today, right, which is Hong Kong and Kowloon. And the question that I, that I have is uh, uh, not to be a crystal ball gazer, right, or to make certain predictions, right, about the future, but I know that the question before us is what are the prospects, right, for Hong Kong Kowloon, right, to join the ranks of historically the cities that have been great artistic cities. So what are the prospects, uh, given what we know of history for Hong Kong? And let me uh, say that in my judgment, there's no question that all of the ingredients right, are already present in Hong Kong. Certainly, economics right, matters fundamentally. Uh, what we see in Hong Kong is great wealth, uh, and great prosperity, and again, this is a relative index, but this is the best social science ranking all 178 countries in the world, and consistently for the last 15 years, Hong Kong and Singapore, they jockey back and forth for being the most economically free right, nations in the world. Of course, the 800-pound uh, gorilla, right, so to speak, right in the room is uh, mainland China. Um, let me just actually back up one step and say, in addition to the relative de degree of uh, economic freedom that Hong Kong has. It has economic uh, infrastructure that is excellent, right? world class, uh, transportation, access to the internet, uh, and so forth, access to all new technologies which are often uh, important to developing innovative art as well. Now certainly though, uh, politics uh, looms large here as it has in every other art city right historically. Hong Kong is right next to and officially a part right, of uh, uh, China right as a whole, but with its commitment to the, uh, the basic law, its inheritance of institutions from British times, right, Hong Kong does have a strong commitment to a species of democratic Republican politics, one of the other important ingredients, and the rule of law is well established here, uh, and that seems to be significant as well. And I think uh, the economic infrastructure that has been developed and the rule of law, those are largely instrumental for explaining why Hong Kong, right, is basically an island with very few natural resources, can become a uh, spectacularly wealthy can't predict what Beijing will do, can't predict how Hong Kong will strategize to keep its uh, current state of uh, uh, freedom uh, and so forth, but I would say that historically, right, great art cultures have coexisted right, w with being close to authoritarian regimes breathing down their necks. Right? For the Athenians, they were constantly in fear of the Persians. Right? for the Florentines. They're constantly right, afraid of the French and the Spanish, the great powers at the time. The Dutch were again afraid of the Spanish, worried about the British. Right? The French worried about the Prussians. Right? In the 20th century, the United States worried about the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Great art cultures can coexist with authoritarian right, political threats. 